some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey everyone, welcome back to Board Games Unlocked, and today I'm doing my ranking of the Final Girl Season 1 locations. If you haven't seen my video for the ranking of the Final Girl Season 1 villains, or killers, whatever they're actually called, uh, definitely go check that out. But, now, I'm going to be talking about the locations that they are played at. Uh, so, the uh, caveat for this one is similar to the killer one in that I am comparing them as a box set. So if you were to go out and buy just one box set, that's the killer that is associated with the location. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, again, as I mentioned with the ranking of the villains for Season 1, uh, these can be mixed and matched in any order, which is going to change how these locations are played, but I haven't played every single combination. This is just my thoughts on the locations by themselves and also not how they how they work with the villain because that would be a different kind of ranking overall um which i mean i could do i could just rank the uh rank the boxes but um but yeah so uh with that being said let's go ahead and start with my number five there are only five in season one and that is camp happy trails uh, so basically, there's not a whole lot to talk about for this one. Now, the uh, if you open it up, <clears throat> Camp Happy Trails looks like uh, Camp Crystal Lake, which I'm pretty sure is uh, I think that's what it was called. And this it goes with Hans. That's how they uh, that's how, how the box set comes with. But basically, whenever you open this up and you're like, oh man, this has 10 event cards, 5 setup cards, some various tokens, some items. Okay, cool, cool. What are the rules? Oh, there's no rules. <laughs> this is the standard um, kind of beginner. Hey, if you want to learn how to play Final Girl, you use this box set. And I should also mention that just because this is number 5 doesn't mean I think it's bad. Like, I actually think all the locations are good. Uh, they for you know for their own rights um, again this one doesn't have any special rules to it it has quite a few locations I mean there is like like if you get like the boat key item then you can use this boat and like you can go across the lake and stuff but other than that this is kind of your bog standard location nothing bad nothing amazing it just works it suffices I will say it is also very thematic because if you're familiar with Camp Crystal Lake and then you're playing this against Hans <clears throat> then you do know that it kind of feels like that the uh, Friday the 13th movie and this definitely has that especially the event cards that come with it they have that that trope um and like oh man there's a like you have a couple that's off in the in the utility shed getting it on and then they're massacred it has stuff like that so this is very familiar just a nice even location which is camp happy trails that's my number five. Oh no! Let's put the let's put the rules back in. Let's put you right back where you belong. All right. <clears throat> so that is number five. Number four is uh, one that's actually kind of surprising that I um, that I actually had lower, but uh, but here it is anyway. Just because, and it's at number four because it does more to to the game than just nothing, and that is the Carnival of Blood. So the Carnival of Blood location is similar to the Camp Happy Trails. So the way it looks is there are, like, instead of the art, of course, there's a lot of locations to go to, a lot of different spots that allow you to, uh, like, go and search for items, and then there's uh, quite a few exits, but also just a bunch of things that are connected, especially if victims start panicking, then they have a lot of places to go. The reason why this is higher than Camp Happy Trails is because it actually does have some special rules. Uh, the Carnival of Blood adds trap cards, so there are trap terror cards and there are trap item cards, and that just adds a little bit of drama and suspense whenever you're flipping over a trap, or you're flipping over a terror, or you're flipping over an item card unseen, and it's a trap. And the traps are... Oh, I don't, uh, like, one of them's a snake, one of them's, like, saw blades and stuff, and one of them's, like, a bear trap that if you're going to search and you're like, oh, I really need to find a weapon, and you go in and you step in the bear trap, it, like, deals some damage to you, and you have to spend, like, two movement points to, like, get out of it. Or two time, I think is what it was. That was just a nice little element that 
to the item decks, it kind of changed to where you're like, huh, like you're not so willy-nilly looking through them. And they're one-time hit. I mean, there are things to bring them back. I think there's a tarot card card called uh, why, How Are There So Many Traps or something, and all the ones that have been used get shuffled back into the decks. Other than that, they're normally just kind of like one time, and they're not that debilitating. They can be, maybe in certain situations, but I think that adds to the theme of this location. I do like that there are many locations. Some of the event cards are very fun. One of the ones in the run-through I had for this was a golf cart, and if you ended the round, you could actually ride it around the, the, the location. So... The Carnival of Blood, thematically really cool, really good, and it just had a little bit more than the Camp Happy Trails. So very, very solid is Carnival of Blood. My number three, <clears throat> which I was actually surprised about that I, as I thought more on it, that I thought, you know, this one is pretty good. I did like the location, and that is Creech Manor. So if you watched my run through of this box set or you or you watched my ranking of this you you would know that I didn't quite care for this experience as as a whole. But I think Creech Manor by itself doesn't actually suffer from any of the issues that I have with the box set. It basically is your standard house, but what's cool is like to go from location to location, you want to actually have to use the steps or the ladder to climb up into the attic. Uh, but they also have these window locations that are basically like considered exits. I mean, you, you still have to go through them, but the only exit in the actual, um, on the actual board are in the street level, so actually getting out of the house. And you could use the windows to crawl out, you know, crawl out yourself or send victims through. Um, like, like the bathroom window or this overall window using the tire swing climb out or this ladder that's on the side. I enjoyed that very much so, especially because a lot of events, like there's an event that can like break this ladder. So it's like, okay, well that room is, you know, dead to us. And it could suck as if you're like running through the house away from whoever is chasing you. You're like running here trying to get some victims out and then you look out the window and the ladder is broken so you can't use it. So then you turn around and then there's a killer in the hallway. I think that this also works really well thematically because a lot of slasher films happen in enclosed spaces. Like unlike the Camp Happy Trails or the Carnival of Blood, that's an open area which can still be creepy, especially a carnival, but it's, it feels better when you have the openness to be able to run away. But when you're enclosed in a house with very few escape routes, that's that's actually pretty terrifying. So it works extremely well. I like the fact that you're not going just you're not able to like teleport from room to room. You actually have to run up and use the steps. It <clears throat> it just worked uh, pretty well in my opinion. So yeah, that is my number three, Creech Manor. Put this back. Then, my number two out of the locations, again, I thought this would be my number one, but as I thought on it, it uh, it ended up just kind of sliding down to number two, and there's a big reason why it ended up being number two versus number one. But my number two is Maple Lane. Maple Lane kind of uh, has that same familiarity, especially if you watch... Funny enough, I... I say I don't like slasher films, but I've seen a lot of them. Uh, just I guess it's just one of those things that they're they're popcorn movies. Uh, but Maple Lane is the the biggest reason that I find Maple Lane like so compelling is it, and it could have been just because I had such a great time with the with the villain. But I like the idea of this actually feeling like a lived-in community. You have, in all the other ones, it is Final Girl. Like, it's pretty much just you. Yeah, you have the victims, but they're faceless. They don't do anything except scream and run and die. Here, you actually have houses. So there's four different locations. Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, North, uh, Southwest. And if there are victims in those houses, you actually have to convince them to let you in. Those are the only areas that you can search. Now, there are, if they're not there, if there's no victims in the house, then you can just go in and search, but they're very limited. So you can walk in and be like, I found nothing but this flashlight, or, oh, thank God, a shotgun. 
But if victims are in there, then you have to actually use a card. There's a new card that comes with this called um, Convince that you have to spend your time on to let them in. And the good thing about those cards is like it's not like, oh, you failed, there's nothing you can do. There's If you super succeed, yeah, they just let you in and you can immediately take an item. In fact, they just kind of give it to you. But if you super fail, you force your way in and take some damage. And I like that. I like how it's not like an all or nothing. It's like, okay, how how much do you convince them? Do they keep saying no, 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 and then you're like, fuck you, and you shoulder your way in and, and get the item anyway? Well, not anyway. If you shoulder your way in, you have to wait or use a card to search. Doing really well allows you to <clears throat> go in and get an item. But what's also interesting about this, and this was kind of why it didn't end up being my number one, is it's not, like, crystal clear on like how you how you move around like a lot of these locations don't have um like arrows to one another like in every other location it's like yeah there are arrows here but it's like if is this one location can i move from this house to this house and you just kind of have to assume so it's not 100 percent clear some of them do have the lines that okay well obviously i can move from there to there in that house but can i move from this street up into this backyard well there's no line but thematically I'd be able to hop the fence or something so it's just kind of a little too ambiguous on the movement um which kind of makes sense because it's a small suburb it does thematically tie in that like you could just quickly run across the street hop a fence and be in the next district over but still uh, there is something about having hard and fast rules but yeah this one kind of shares the same overall thematic feeling that the Creech Manor has of, okay, well, you're in familiar territory, you're limited in where you can go because you're trapped by houses, you're, you have to go to houses. Um, but yeah, you also have the openness of being able to leave the house and run across the street. So it kind of takes the best of both of those and combines it into one. And I really like the convincing option. That just adds an extra element. It thematically means, hey, these victims are actually like hiding or they're locking their doors and they're like, yeah, no, no, we're not letting you in. And you're like, fuck you, I still need to. And because there's only five, you should know what my number one is, which is the Sacred Groves. The Sacred Groves, like the other, the two below it that are, um, where are you? There we go. The two below it that are like Camp Happy Trails and all the other ones, pretty much everything except the house, which is kind of open, is uh, is similar in layout to that. However, what like the killer for this, this comes with a Divine Wrath card. Where the for the killer, and I know I said I'm not really comparing these locations with who they're paired with, but the killer for this Inkanyambe has like a killer's wrath. Well, the Divine Wrath actually ties into the gods of this location. So, as time goes on, there's the Burial Ground, the Sacred Shrine, and the Holy Ground. And these are basically kill spots for, um, for like, victims. They're the ones, the victims that are going here how are, like, trashing these very holy sites. And that's pissing off the gods, which increases this track. I really like the idea of this track going up. It's so cool. Uh, and it, it's just, and it's not like super brutal. So like at one, you lose a time and you increase divine wrath by one at four, you discard a random action card at five, you lose four time at nine raise terror and then lose four time. And at 10, you discard all your action cards, except atonement and decrease, um, divine wrath by the number of cards discarded. Like, that hurts. Like, if you have no cards in hand to do anything, that, that hurts. Because they get discarded and you can't get them back until the following round. It just feels like there's an air of... I mean, not only is there a killer running around, but that there's some other mystical beings that are hurting you through the actions of others. And this also makes you feel like you're like, no, I'm, I'm on your side. Like, I would love to turn around and kill these victims for you. And you're almost wanting them to get caught because you're like, but it hurts you, it makes the killer be more bloodlusted. But you're like, well, if there's no one in those three locations, then the gods can't be upset. And I know there was like an event that like brought in more people. They're like, ooh, man, look at the, I've heard about the, the blossom trees. And then I heard that we can tie our shoes together and throw them over. I heard we can like pluck these and just take them. And you're like, 
I want you to get your throat cut. I I like the openness of it, but I also like that, uh, just that overbearing presence of like mystical deities that are cursing you. It's just the the card thing is really really cool, and it's not like there's a lot of big locations here, so it's easier to go from one side of the map to the other, which is good for you, but also bad as you are hunted down. So. That ended up being my number one out of Season 1, The Sacred Groves. And that's it, everyone. That is my uh, ranking for the Season 1 locations. Let me know what you think of them in the comments below. I will be, of course, doing rankings for Season 2 locations. Uh, so definitely check those out when it comes. But other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe. And have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you. Hey everyone, thank you for watching and I really hope that you enjoyed the video. If you would like to see more of my content, go ahead and click that subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever I upload any new content. If you feel like supporting the channel, you can go ahead and click that Patreon link to be taken to my Patreon and any help is truly appreciated. Other than that, stick around for any, any other run-throughs or reviews or cool top tens or whatever I feel like putting on. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you.